Hello, my name is Beth Genley, and I am this year Vice President for Education for Toastmasters for Speaking Professionals, which is a club that I love. Through that club, I became acquainted with TV Toastmasters. I got interviewed here a few times and began to learn how to speak to a camera and how different that is from speaking to a group, how to connect with an audience that I can't see, and how to stay focused on a camera that is not talking back to me or smiling. After I did that a few times, I was invited to become an associate producer here, and now I'm bringing people from my club and other interesting people to TV Toastmasters each month and finding out wonderful stories and fantastic individuals who are contributing a great deal to our community. It's been a great ride. I'm really looking forward to seeing what the next year will bring as TV Toastmasters continues to be the voice for District 7. Welcome back to TV Toastmasters. I'm your host, Eric Bergman. I'm with We Toasted Toastmasters in Lake Oswego, as well as a member of TV Toastmasters here in Beaverton. And tonight, our topic is cybersecurity. How safe is your cell phone? How safe is your laptop? I have a return guest. About a year ago, Christopher Taylor visited, and he told us about how he had used his Toastmasters experience to get a promotion at a big national company where he was a cybersecurity advisor. Now he's on his own with a company called Three Tree Tech, and he's here to talk about cybersecurity and how you can protect yourself. Welcome, Christopher Taylor. Thank you, for, Eric, for having me. It's good to have you back. I looked it up. It was about a year ago this month that we talked about how you turned your Toastmasters skills into a, a job promotion. And that was great to hear. And, and clearly, you've been on the move ever since. I have, and I owe it to the Toastmasters. That is accurate. That's great. And we're glad you're back to share more information. The subject is cybersecurity. And people have a lot to be concerned about in the cyber world. We hear about attacks on people's email. We yep. hear about security breaches at financial companies. Every day. Can you talk about what the security landscape looks like? What are the threats? What are we facing? And then we'll get into how can we each do something about it. Sure, okay. Um, currently today, you know, cybersecurity is a, a big industry, as you well know. Um, companies are, are vulnerable in multiple ways. They use technology now to improve their business and they have to use a lot of uh, countermeasures to protect their business because today mm -hmm. if you if you get if your company has been breached there are a lot of protocols and things that a company has to do there's a lot of liability and it costs them a lot of money mm -hmm. so today that's a necessary i hate to say a necessary evil but that's something that people have to take into consideration if you own a business today so you have to protect your network right and we as consumers may be giving our information to various companies. They have access to that information and we're depending on them to protect it, to keep our information private. That's correct, yeah. And I can also talk about the consumer. You know, a, a lot of folks watching today, they may be interested in how do they, you know, how can they protect themselves? Well, how, how do cyber criminals, how, how do you get hacked? What does that look like? And so I'm happy to answer any questions for you. Well, let's start right there. How does a person get hacked, an individual rather than a company? Sure. Okay. From an individual perspective, and uh, you know, so I, I have my, my cell phone on me here. This is my this is my prop today. So, on a computer, you do things on your work computer. You you would not do things on your work computer that you would do on your home computer. Whenever you do searches, so most people would would uh, you you click on things, you visit various sites, and you look at material on your personal computer. But on your cell phone, your trusted device, you mm. click and look on everything. So you're surfing mm. sites, you're clicking on apps, you're installing apps. Most hacking happens on the application layer. So uh, that, that's where, on, mm. the, on the OSI uh, uh, layer seven is where hacking happens most of the time. And most hacking happens via a phishing attempt. So someone like, so a hacker 
would send some malicious code to a contact, and this is the part that should scare people. If I spoof an email to one of your contacts, it's going to show up as a contact in your phone only. Mm -hmm. And a few minutes later, if I want to hack into your, your corporate network, for example, a, a few minutes later, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sync with your exchange server. So then I send my malicious email, my phishing attack. And if you click on that, and when, when I send that, if you, if, if you have it saved as good old mom, so you're going to send, you're going to see the message as good old mom on, on the on the email or text, mm -hmm. and you know, and I say, hey, click on this link, and once you do, I'm behind your company's firewall, just like that, or I'm into your device, and once I do that, I, I ARP the network. So you know, ARP, it's not malicious code; it just crawls the network and it looks for what known vulnerabilities does someone have, has, has their patching been done, and once I get a, a, a blueprint of someone's network then I can send my malicious code that's specific to that company's network or your home network. And once I do that, I'm going to set up my little pieces of malicious code everywhere because I know eventually someone's going to find that code at some point. And that code's going to be dormant. And once they do and eliminate it, then the other piece of code becomes active. And it becomes this big cat, cat and a mouse game to get me out. And so that's essentially how hacking happens. And even today, in 2019, the data breach investigative report says that the average time that someone's mm -hmm. been breached before they realize they've been breached is seven months. And that's a company. So most individuals, most people at home that are watching this segment, they've been breached for years and they don't, they just don't know it. They're unaware. And, and cyber criminals today use your computer for a number of, of, of reasons. You know, years ago, they would use your computer for a DDoS attack. So they would use, and they would, uh, people call them zombies, they would have a, maybe a network of 100,000 computers and could point them at a specific company website and take that website traffic down. So whenever you uh, access a website, there's what's called a three-part, a three-way handshake. Mm -hmm. And during that handshake, they just overwhelm that network and, and it takes them down. So there are DDoS pa packages out there where companies can protect their network, um, but that's, that's one of the things they do. And then today, uh, obviously, they use the, the computers for mining. For, for Bitcoin mining. So your computer at home, even though you're not using it, a lot, a lot of that, uh, your, your computer's usage is used uh, for mining it, once it's been hacked. And then lastly, a lot of times they'll infiltrate you like your Gmail account. Mm -hmm. So they're in your Gmail account and you say, well, well that's not really a harm. How is it going to hurt me? And uh, one example is, that, let's say you're going to buy a home and mm -hmm. you know, they see those emails going back and forth with mortgage companies, you applying for a loan. They're going to wait right until the moment whenever you're going to send that money. So you may have you may have, have, have sold the, sold your home and been paid four or five hundred thousand mm -hmm. for your home, and then when it's time for the wiring instructions, they will that that's when the hacker will send their attack. And once they send that wiring instruction, it, once you make that wire, if you actually wire that to a hacker overseas, it's gone. You mm -hmm. cannot recoup that money, mm -hmm. and you can lose you can lose it all. And that is how a hacker can affect just the, the common day person that doesn't have a network at all, that just has a home computer. That's an exact case that came up recently. Somebody making that, that big house payment to buy a house and it was the, uh, a fake email. They sent their money to the wrong place. And I think that, so that's, that could happen to anyone, really. It happens to people all the time. So, you know, we do, yeah. I work with one of the largest uh, companies out there that purchases, that, that uh, mortgage companies, one of the largest mortgage companies. And the FBI put out a video called the Vimeo uh, Homeless Home Buyer, V-I-M-E-O Homeless Home Buyer. It's only a two or three minute long episode, and I urge people to watch it. It'll educate them greatly on that topic. So we have potential attacks through our cell phones that we carry everywhere and use everywhere. And we have uh, attacks through our email, our home computer. How safe are we when we're out, say, using a, a public Wi-Fi hotspot, say in a coffee shop? What are things that you would or would not do in that setting that would be different than what you would do on a more protected network, say, in an office or even at your house? Okay, that's a good question as well. I personally would not use uh, those uh, those free Wi-Fi environments, and here's why. Just picture the picture uh, a large organization that offers free Wi-Fi that someone goes to. They use a service called Captini for that, and Captini, what it does is it collects all of that information and it sells it for advertising. So people don't realize whenever you click accept to uh, part of the process when you log on to use that wireless internet, you are allowing them to 
capture, save, and use all of the data that, you know, not just your web browser history, but a lot of other information as well. And so essentially it's for advertising. I mean, they get everything. They get demographics, they get you know, age, you name it. They add all that in, and at the end of the day, they really just want to sell you something. So, but they collect that, that data. So the, the old saying, you know, nothing's for free, that, that applies in that regard. So that's what you're giving up for that. So say if I'm sitting in the coffee shop searching for what kind of a new car I might buy, it would be no surprise to you that uh, the next time I look at my device again, there may be an ad for that car dealer or that brand of car near me. That's exactly how it works. So the next time you go on Facebook, what are the advertisements you're going to see? Mm -hmm. It's going to be for a car. And that's one way that happens. So I would, I, would, I, would, I would throw this out there for, for some of the people that just wonder, you know, how often are my devices monitored? Mm -hmm. Anything that's a smart device, your information can be collected and ultimately sold to you for advertising. You know, just a good way to take mm -hmm. the Pepsi challenge that I would like to tell the viewers out there, walk by your smart TV. If your TV is a smart TV, walk by it when it's off and say something that you've never said before. If you're old and don't have any kids anymore, walk by and say, I need to go buy diapers. Then go to Facebook and see what the first advertisement is going to be, and it's yeah. probably going to scare you. Yeah. Of course, now that's not specifically hacking, just people getting you to accept the terms of service and then collecting data from you and then using it to have someone send ads to you later. It's an invasion of privacy yeah. and it, it, yeah. that, that people have been hacked already and they just don't realize it. So yeah. technically it, it, it's hacking because someone has already found a way to access your device to collect that information and mm -hmm. ultimately sell it for advertising. Let's see. So what, what is driving the hackers to do this? Is it all financial gain or is it some of it the cat and mouse, I'm smarter than you, I can break any defense that you set up? You, you kind of answered your question, you, you answered a, a piece of it. Okay. So <laughs> there are a lot of people out there, a lot of times when, when people want to find, there, there are different t kind of uh, hatters out there. So there's a, you know, a black hatter that's just doing it to, for illegal gain. Mm -hmm. There's a white hatter that wants to just help uh, the greater good and show people where the vulnerabilities out there. There's red hatters that they're paid to go out and, and find these holes. So there are different types of, of hackers, uh, but uh, there, it, you, we, you never know. It could be a 13-year-old kid in a basement with a lot of free time. That you know, kids are kids are, are, are intuitive. Kids are kids are crafty. They've grown. They've been born and raised with this technology. So they're they're good at finding a, a way around. A, a lot of the uh, vulnerabilities that have been discovered have been by kids. You know, when you, when you look recently, uh, you know, uh, iPhone was recently notified of a, a vulnerability that a 14-year-old found. So. You know, ki kids are intuitive, but but it can be. Uh, it can be state hackers. You, you just never know. But there are there are some countries more prolific than others. But at the end of the day, it's it's typically financial gain. And when you look at uh, 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 malware, you name it. Great. This is Christopher Taylor, our cybersecurity expert, brought in to talk about that subject tonight. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back to, with you in just a moment. Speak in public? I'd rather be burned at the stake. At least that's how I used to feel, until Toastmasters. I went online and found a club that met every week at lunchtime, and they were close to my office, so it worked out great. I was really scared when I started, but no one pressured me to speak or pushed me to do anything I wasn't ready for. I felt safe, and I realized it was okay to be nervous and to make mistakes, because these people were going to support and encourage me no matter what. And now, well, let's just say things have changed. I speak in front of large groups, lead all-day seminars, and conduct presentations to top executives. Toastmasters change my life. There are over 100 Toastmasters clubs meeting all around the Portland, Vancouver area, near your office, home, or even your school. We meet on all days of the week, morning, noon, and night. Our clubs couldn't be more convenient or affordable at under $10 a month. Visit a couple locations and find the one that's just right for you. All the information you need is at Toastmasters.org. We're back again with TV Toastmasters. I'm your host, Eric Bergman. And my guest is Christopher Taylor, cybersecurity expert. He's here to tell us how we can be safer online. Christopher, I'd love to hear your tips for what people can do 
right now to feel more safe and protect their privacy and their personal data. What do you recommend? Okay, sure, a, a, a number of things. One, security updates. A lot of times you get notifications that say, update the security. You need to do that. When you get those updates, do that. That's number one. Two, change your password. Don't keep the same password that you have with all of your sites. People tend to, to do the same password. Have a notebook somewhere where you can write with, with each, you know, uh, whatever service that you use, uh, but, but change up that password and make up random characters. I would also suggest that. And then lastly, multi-factor authentication, MFA. That's a, that's a better way. So what, some people, what people don't realize in, in the cyber world today is that cyber criminals, picture this, cyber criminals are jiggling millions of doorknobs a second. And when they find an unlocked door, they just walk through and they go farther and farther and farther. Mm -hmm. And they go until they find a locked door. So lock the front door. <laughs> and if you don't do those things, you're not locking the front door and you're breached and you've already been hacked. I just heard that two of the worst passwords you can possibly have are 1234 and password. So those are, if you use <laughs> anything those. like that for your password, change it immediately. Right away. You talked about multi-factor authentic authentication. What is that in simple terms that we can understand? Two different types of uh, authentication. It, that, that's, uh, and there's, there's multiple there's services that you can use, but yes, that, that's, that's a suggestion. Okay, great. Now, we, we were talking about the, the nature of the hacker's mind, and th of course the technology industry is always trying to stay a step ahead of the people who would misuse the system, bring down the system, or compromise it. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about some of the trends now in computing that will maybe make a difference, that will change the playing field? For instance, I've heard about quantum computing on the rise. What is that, and what effect will that have on uh, the computing world that we live in? Okay, uh, so quantum computing. Our computers that we use today, they are called classical computers because of quantum computing. Uh, it is a revolutionary technology where when you look in computer terms, you have a bit and a byte, a one and a zero. Everything over the internet is a one or a zero. Mm -hmm. So when you look at quantum computing, it is, and so whenever you do a computing power, a Cray has the fastest supercomputer, so they can break any encryption in a couple of months. With a quantum computer, you, have, you use a, a photon of light or a gas, or, and it can be a photon of light gas or both. So the digits can be a one, a zero, or both. And by doing that, you can do thousands of comput computations at a time. So essentially, the, the RSA encryption that holds, the, it's the glue of our internet today, it's shattered. It's absolutely shattered. So Google in 2017 was the first public company to come out and say that quantum computing works. Uh, North America, our best quantum computer that we have is a D-Wave uh, out of Canada out of Canada, it's called a D-Wave 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the, uh, the phone companies own D-Waves, all of the intelligence communities own uh, D-Wave 2000 and, and a, a handful of other companies mm -hmm. as well. So, but, but they do, they, they get it down to like negative 283 degrees Celsius, it's really, really cold. So they call it you know, the, the world's uh, biggest, most expensive refrigerator, but it's a technology that works. And so by using quantum computing, it's, it, it's, it's, people are protected by the laws of physics. But right now with that technology, it's distance sensitive. It's a lot like DSL technology was uh, in its infancy in the 70s and 80s. So the, 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 the challenge remains is how do they utilize it on a network that's long range? So any, any short range uh, a situation like uh, the uh, Wall Street, very, very a, a small area, quantum computing is going, is going to protect that network. Uh, the Pentagon, small, it's a, a relatively a, a small, uh, five-sided building, it's going to be able to protect that network. But any long-range network, it's gonna take some time in the future for that to work. But right now, it's, it's, you know, currently that's going to be a very uh, proven system. All right, we'll have to look for what happens in quantum computing. Another term I hear, and I truly don't understand it well, hoping you can provide some explanation, bit chain. Sure, yeah, uh, blockchain. Blockchain, so excuse it, me, blockchain. How does blockchain work? So uh, in people, people uh, 
get that word uh, intermingled all the time with Bitcoin. But so, so Bitcoin, <laughs> Bitcoin is really the, the, the first service that used blockchain technology. So blockchain's been around since 1999. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, in 1999, uh, Napster came out. Do you remember Napster? Oh, so yeah. it, it shook the music industry to its core. It was the first time that, that people had a de decentralized network where you and I could share a piece of music together. And, and, and the only thing Napster did was store that information. So they knew who had each song for how long and, and that, that, that type of thing. The music industry was caught off guard. It really uh, uh, you know, rocked, rocked them to the core. So fast forward to today, there's a lot of services out there that utilize blockchain, but a way that companies can use blockchain from a security perspective is machine state integrity. So in, in, in the blockchain, for, for everyone that, that uses the blockchain, how much time do I have left where I don't, I don't ramble too long? About three minutes. Okay, no problem here. So, <laughs> so when, whenever they, whenever you, you can take the last known state of a machine and you can insert that in the hash. So there, uh, there are a lot of large companies. Uh, there's a really, really large company that has 14 million faxes, copiers, and printers out there. They needed a way to protect their devices, so they looked at a solution like that, where uh, you know every time someone probed for the hash, it told them the last known good state of that machine. And so that's a, that's a blockchain is the technology that can help in that regard from a security perspective. Now your company, Three Tree Tech, is an enterprise type company. You're you're working with big companies that have, say, hundreds of kiosks or or thousands of computers or s all sorts of things like this. Big size companies. What are the primary things that they're looking to protect as as they move forward? It's a really good question. So. Yes, the company I work for at 3Tree Tech solely focuses on protecting the largest of the enterprise cu uh, customers out there. And people don't, people, what people real, you guard your million dollars worth of jewelry differently than you lock your front door from a security perspective. Mm -hmm. And we come up with disruptors in the industry. Like I utilize, with, like, like Napster was a disruptor uh, in, in the music industry, we bring security disruptors out there. One of them out there is called Software Defined Perimeter. Software Defined Perimeter currently is just, it's, it's stumping all the hackers out there. When you ARP the network, you get a blank slate. You just get a sheet. So 99% of hackers don't know what to do if someone utilizes software-defined perimeter. So that's one of the project, that's one of the services that we utilize to customers out there today. That's great. Is really, is this, this game will just keep going back and forth? Is that the hackers trying new approaches, the cybersecurity folks, imposing new tools and new defenses? Is that what we have at our, as long as we have an internet and are using devices that are connected? That, it appears to be the case. <laughs> it's going to be, a, you, 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 you coined it properly. It's going to be a cat and mouse game. You know, as soon as one side catches up, they're, the, the, the other side's going to figure out a way. And so it's going to just keep evolving and evolving. But yeah, right now, that's the way it is. It, it, the security industry is only growing. There's going to be industries and fields that we don't even know exist yet. But, but, you know, but there, and then unfortunately, there are a lot of jobs and industries that are going to be outsourced and, and going to be eliminated because of security. Uh, and because of other measures, like, like blockchain, for example, will will eliminate a lot of industries. So, mm. you know, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Before we close, I'd like to give you the chance to talk about Toastmasters. What clubs are you in these days, and what has it done for you lately? So I'm a member of Feedbackers, and I will say that when I speak in a crowd, if I go do an executive briefing for a customer, it could be intimidating to go to a mm -hmm. boardroom full of executives. I have a specific amount of time, and I have to get a very specific message across, and I owe that to Toastmasters. Because when I first started doing this, boy, I was scared. And mm -hmm. I'm not scared today, and I'm grateful. And I owe that to Toastmasters. That's great. Feedbackers is a Beaverton-based club. It it's is. It's an advanced club. and. Any final word? We have about 30 seconds left. You know what? I appreciate you taking the time to meet with me today, interview with me. I hope, the, I hope anyone watching this program takes the suggestions, updates their computer, changes their password, finds a way to do multi-factor authentication, and just do a little research on the subject. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, you're totally welcome. I hope this has been informative for you. Cybersecurity is a never-ending topic of interest, and Christopher Taylor has told us how we can, right away, 
make ourselves a little bit safer with better passwords. So let's all change those passwords. Get rid of the one, two, three, four. This is Eric Bergman, and I hope you tune in again for the next episode of TV Toastmasters. Hello everyone, my name is Christopher Taylor and I'm with TV Toastmasters. My home group is Feedbackers in Beaverton, Oregon. I first joined Toastmasters for a couple reasons. I was nervous. I had trouble speaking in front of others. I needed some help. And when I joined Toastmasters, not knowing what to expect, I learned several things. One, it gave me the confidence to speak in front of others. I learned how to take constructive criticism. I benefited from that. That benefit was the confidence to get a job. When I took the suggestions in the club, when I started speaking in front of a group and remained speaking through my role, doing table topics, getting topics that you're unaware, learning how to th think on your feet, learning how to speak on your feet. I first started working managing the Berkshire Hathaway account. I started as a back office role, not the face of the company. It didn't take long until I was dealing directly with the executives. Today I give executive briefings for Verizon Enterprise in the highest level in the enterprise space. And I'm grateful and I owe all of that to Toastmasters. Thank you. Hi, I'm Phyllis Harmon. I'm a member of TV Toastmasters. In this club, we have an opportunity to practice speaking before the camera as well as running the equipment room. If you're interested in being interviewed on TV Toastmasters or becoming a member, please go to toastmasters.org and look for us or simply search for TV Toastmasters on the web.